Peterson. I'm the executive director at Gender Justice. We are a Minnesota-based nonprofit legal and policy advocacy organization, and we work to advance gender equity through the law. Since our founding in 2010, we have fought to achieve real and meaningful gender equity through impact litigation, policy advocacy, and public education. We're proud to be here today, standing with our courageous plaintiffs and our co-counsel partners, The Lawyering Project, and bringing this lawsuit to challenge multiple laws that restrict abortion and create obstacles to critical health care in Minnesota. Too many Minnesotans face barriers to accessing the health care we need. It's unconscionable that lawmakers have gone out of their way to create additional barriers to health care, health care that one in four women in America will need in their lifetimes. Minnesota's abortion laws are not only outdated, they're harmful. Far too often, they prevent people from getting the care that they need when they need it. They force healthcare providers to follow politically motivated mandates rather than best practices and standards of care. These laws serve to drive up the cost of care, restrict qualified providers from serving their patients, and generally make abortion access impossible outside of the Twin Cities and Duluth. These laws serve no medical purpose and reflect outdated patriarchal views of women and people who can get pregnant. I'm proud to live in a state that has already established the right to abortion as a fundamental value. In 1995, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that we have a right under our state constitution to have an abortion and also to decide whether or not to have an abortion. And that we have a right to do this without government interference or bias. It's past time to strike down these laws and in the state that don't meet this common sense standard. At Gender Justice, we believe that everyone should have the power and ability to make decisions about our own bodies, to decide whether and when to become a parent. Today, alongside our courageous plaintiffs, we're saying enough is enough. Everyone has a right to abortion without being manipulated, judged, or shamed as a result of unconstitutional laws. As attacks on, safe, on access to safe, legal, essential reproductive health care sweep through many other states across the country, now is the time to respect our state constitution, respect women and equality, and protect all of our rights and freedom. Thank you. Um, you're gonna now hear from our co-counsel, Amanda Allen, from The Loring Project, and we'll take questions from you all uh, after all of our speakers have given their statements. Good morning, thank you for having me. My name is Amanda Allen, I'm senior counsel and director at the Loring Project, and I'm a native Minnesotan. I grew up in Monticello. We founded the Loring Project in order to dismantle entire regimes of abortion restrictions that states have quietly and federally built up in the decades since growth. We know that these restrictions have no basis in science, no basis in medicine, and instead they're designed to shame and punish, in some cases, criminalize people for seeking to end their pregnancy. Can I just say the last few weeks have been especially dismal for reproductive rights? Anti-abortion politicians across the country are finally saying out loud what we've known all along, that their goal is to outlaw abortion entirely, control reproductive decision-making, and prosecute not only reproductive health care providers, but their patients as well. That's why the Loring Project is so proud to partner with this amazing coalition of advocates here today in bringing this lawsuit and launching the unrestricted Minnesota campaign. We intend to leverage Minnesota's strong constitutional protections of abortion rights to eliminate the state's harmful laws. We intend to bring Minnesota's abortion regulations into the 21st century and in line with how other forms of health care are regulated, without shame, without stigma, or undue interference from the state. We're challenging all of these laws at once because we know they work together to burden access to abortion care. We're challenging them all at once because we know they work together to harm people for whom health care is already furthest from reach. And we know that they work together to shame patients, criminalize would-be providers, and make abortion access out of reach for many. I'm a Minnesotan. I know that these laws are out of line with our values. To think freely, to respect each other's choices, even if we disagree, and to be free from government interference in our personal decisions. And given everything that's going on in our country right now, I can't think of a more important place to be than right here, right now, to say not here, not in Minnesota. We can't afford to wait any longer. Thank you for being here. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Kelly Clement of the First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis, who is also a plaintiff in this lawsuit.
Good morning. My name is Reverend Kelly Clement. I'm the Social Justice Minister at the First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. At First Unitarian, we assert the right to live in a society where every individual is able to get the resources they need to care for themselves and their families, including meaningful access to the full range of reproductive health care. Instead, Minnesotans are faced with a list of anti-abortion laws that do nothing to protect their health or safety. And the laws are not meant to protect their health or safety. Anti-abortion laws serve only to interfere in personal decision-making that rightfully belongs between a patient and their doctors. These laws seek to make access to abortion care as challenging as possible just to drive the message home that anti-abortion politicians believe that Minnesotans can't be trusted to know what is best for their lives and that they deserve to be shamed for their decisions. This goes against everything we hold as Unitarian Universalists. For too long, we've allowed politicians to decide what basic health care is available to Minnesotans. It's time for that to change. Minnesotans deserve high quality health care, health care that's not attached to a political agenda, and the ability to make their own personal decisions. It's time for Minnesotans, it's time that Minnesotans are able to live under the freedoms guaranteed by the Minnesota Constitution. That's why I'm proud to stand here to say, to say it's time to unrestrict Minnesota. The First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis has a long history of supporting reproductive health, rights, and justice. We affirm that Minnesotans should be able to make their own personal health care decisions without shame or stigma, which these laws only make worse. As people of faith, as Unitarian Universalists, as Congregational Humanists, we know that people who experience abortion and miscarriage need our compassion trust, and support, and we are on their side. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karina Smith, and my work has long been centered in the reproductive justice movement. I'm a co-director on the board of directors of the Spiral Collective, a radical collective that provides free, compassionate, non judgmental support to the full spectrum of people and all of their reproductive experiences with the intention of empowering bodily autonomy. I am the board of directors co chair for Our Justice, an organization that funds abortions and defends reproductive freedom. And finally, in my day job, I'm an LPN at Family Tree Clinic, a clinic that specializes in care for the LGBTQ community and sexual and reproductive health. This lawsuit brought today is one step in making reproductive justice a reality in Minnesota. Reproductive justice is about people having the agency to be who they are and to create and sustain the types of families and communities they desire. It's about shifting and eliminating infringements on sexual and reproductive human rights. The reproductive justice movement is my home. It is where I live. Literally, because I am part of the marginalized communities that are disproportionately harmed about abortion restrictions. Femmes who look like me are targeted for politically motivated attacks, for seeking reproductive health care of any kind, birth control, abortion, life reform, medical services. Of them, a person, male, female, or non-binary, who identifies and presents with a feminine gender identity. It is us femmes whose lives are policed and stigmatized as we simply try to make the best choices for ourselves and our families, often without the support and resources that we need. My community experiences this politicization every day. I experience this every day. This is why I passionately feel that it is time for Minnesotans to understand that while yes, we are a progressive leader in many ways, and in others, we still have a long way to go. There is no choice where there is no access. As others here have discussed, 
We have a host of abortion restrictions that are not only unconstitutional, but are unjust. Laws that require additional medically unnecessary appointments, that create delays in care and cause more stress and disruption in the lives of low-income folks. Laws that severely limit which healthcare professionals can provide abortion, forcing many people to leave their communities and travel long distances to find the care that they need. Laws that dictate exactly what doctors must tell patients before they're allowed to have an abortion attempting to shame and mislead. It is additionally cruel for femmes of color whose choices are already judged at every turn. I love Minnesota. Minnesota is my home. I want Minnesotans to understand that abortion is a normal part of health care, not one that's removed from our everyday lives. That is why I want the best for our state and for everyone who lives here. I dream about the ways Minnesota can be more reflective of my values, our values. And through this campaign and the people here today, I hope to make them real. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Erin May Quaid. I'm the Advocacy Director at Gender Justice. As we've heard today, in 1995, in Joe B. Gomez, the Minnesota Supreme Court found that the Minnesota Constitution protects both our right to have an abortion and the right to decide to have an abortion. And without the government trying to sway us one way or the other. We here do not bear the burden of showing that the abortion restrictions in Minnesota are unconstitutional. As with all laws that impinge on fundamental rights, which the right to have or decide to have an abortion is, the state bears the burden of proving that these laws are narrowly tailored and serve a compelling state interest. Minnesotans consider our state extraordinary. I know I do, and rightly so. We have a rich history of leading the nation and securing rights for our citizens. 86% of Minnesota voters think that our laws support right and access to safe abortion, but our confidence has been betrayed. For decades, anti-abortion zealots have been using harmful rhetoric, misleading language, and deliberate misinformation and legislative tricks to quietly pass laws that restrict abortion access in Minnesota. And while 70% of Minnesota voters agree with the Supreme Court ruling, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruling in Doe v. Gomez, said, uh, more than 400 anti-abortion laws have been passed since that decision in 1995, including a number of outright abortion bans that mirror Alabama's. 82% of Minnesotans don't want this issue to be politicized anymore. So in addition to this coalition bringing this lawsuit, we have come together with clinics, providers, advocates, and community partners to launch a summer-long public education campaign. This public education campaign will provide Minnesotans with the facts about abortion and abortion laws in our state. We do not seek to influence opinion, but simply to inform the public about the state of abortion care in Minnesota. Before I turn it over for questions, I want to pause and remind everyone, especially in this room, that 76% of the things that Minnesotans hear about abortion in the news are related to the politics of abortion. And only 4% of the stories about abortion are actually about the people who have abortions or seek abortion care. <coughs> so as this public education campaign and litigation moves forward, we will no doubt hear anti-abortion zealots do shaming and insulting and flat out untrue language to score political points to sway people who might not know a lot about the restrictions or abortion itself. But I need the rest of us to do better. As the esteemed Minnesotan and women's rights advocate Jane Hodgson once said, if at any time I've ever had any doubt about what I'm doing, all I have to see is the patient and talk to her, and I realize it's the right thing. One in four Minnesotans with uteri will have an abortion before the age of 45. So when we talk about people who have abortions, when we talk about people who seek abortion care, we are talking about people. And we need to talk about them like they're someone we love, because the reality is they are. And they're why we're here today. They're why we're standing up and fighting to protect reproductive rights in Minnesota. They're why it's time to unrestrict Minnesota. I'll take questions now. Thank you. Absolutely, I can. We have a sheet of paper um, that lists the restrictions, but I'll just name some of them now. There's a law that mandates doctors provide medically irrelevant and biased information to patients. 
There's a law that prevents advanced practice clinicians from prescribing medication abortion or providing the procedure early in pregnancy, even though it's well within their scope of practice. There's a law that mandates that people make an extra medically unnecessary appointment for care. There's a law that mandates that doctors talk about a man's obligation to pay child support before a woman is allowed to have an abortion. There is a law that mandates that doctors provide detailed information on each patient to the state commissioner of health. It's reported out, and you have to report how many miscarriages you have, how many children you have, the county that you live in, your age, the specific reason you're having the abortion, how you're paying for the abortion. Additionally, the State Department of Health requires that race, marital status, and the level of education you received is reported out. There's a mandate that fetal tissue uh, from abortion must be cremated or buried. And there's a mandate that minors must notify both of their parents for the decision to have an abortion, even if the minor has an abusive relationship or no relationship with one or both of their parents. And I don't need to remind you, I hope that minors do not have to notify their parents to make a whole host of other medical decisions, including the decision to have birth. Other questions? Can you talk about, um, sorry if I missed this before, but just, um, you know, Minnesota has uh, Gomez versus Doe and kind of it, what role you think that could play in this, the success of, of this challenge? I should probably leave that to the lawyers, but I will say that, that that decision out of the Minnesota Supreme Court is part of the reason we're doing this because our values have been read out by our Constitution and our Supreme Court have outlined them. They've just been passing laws despite that ruling since 1995. Lawyer? <laughs> um, yeah, the Dovey Gomez decision establishes that the right to privacy under the Minnesota Constitution is a fundamental right, and the court requires strict scrutiny, which is the highest level of constitutional protection, um, the highest possible constitutional standard. And um, as, as I think somebody else mentioned, that requires that the, the state's interest be compelling in the restriction and that the law be narrowly tailored to that interest. It's a very high bar for a state to clear, um, and that's why we think that this, um, this challenge, especially under the Minnesota Constitution, um, we, we think that we have a good shot. So you talked about these laws being enacted since 1995. Why now? Why the, why the urgency in filing it now? So there have been uh, over 400 anti-abortion laws introduced since 1995. Uh, as we've seen this moment in this nation, uh, reproductive rights are under attack. The, the quiet part has been said out loud. The point is to ban abortion outright, criminalize providers, and criminalize women. There is no more time to wait to protect and fully avail ourselves of the rights that we have under the Constitution here in Minnesota. Is there a fear Minnesota could go by the way, like Georgia or Alabama or Missouri for that fact? With the abortion ban laws? Yes. I have that fear. We have been uh, one governor away from some of those anti-abortion politicians being able to sign their bills into law under Governor Dayton, and right now we're a handful of legislators and a Governor Walls away from being that state. Abortion bans have been introduced in Minnesota. The last one, I believe, was introduced uh, in March of 2018 by Senator Dan Hall, um, and, and he is not the only one. There have been a number of ways they've attempted to do that. So I, I have uh, all the fear in the world that we will follow Alabama, Missouri, Georgia, um, if we don't fully avail ourselves of the protections that we have, uh, because one governor, a few handful of legislators away from, from, from being that. 